point-to-point -point connections. Uh, one of the most common types of our WAN connections, especially when we're looking at uh, buildings or networks that cover a long distance uh, as point to point connections. They're sometimes called serial or lease lines connections and these connections are typically provided by carrier carriers such as your telephone company, your ISP. It's who you purchase uh, your access from. And it's man the boundaries between what is managed by the carrier and what is managed by you, the customer, must be established. Uh, what we're going to go over in this chapter are terms, technology, protocols used in serial connections. Um, the HDLC and the point-to-point -point or PPP are introduced. Point-to-point uh, -point is a protocol that's able to handle the authentication, compression, your error detection, your monitor link quality, and logically bundles multiple serial connections together to share the load. So in this chapter, we're going to explain the fundamentals of point-to-point -point serial communication across a WAN. We're going to configure HDLC encapsulation on point-to-point -point serial link. We're going to describe the benefits of using PPP over HDLC in a WAN. We're also going to describe the PPP layered architecture and the functions of LCP and NCP. We'll explain how PPP session is established. We're going to configure the PPP encapsulation on a point-to-point -point serial link. We're going to configure point-to-point -point authentication protocols and then use the show and debug commands to be able to troubleshoot our point-to-point -point, because that's always important is to be able to troubleshoot it. With serial communication using our point-to-point -point, uh, connections, they're used to connect LANs to service provider WANs. They also refer to as our serial connection or our lease line connection. Uh, Remember, in our live labs, we're using our blue serial cables to connect our two routers that are actually sitting next to each other. But in the real world, they're not going to be so close. Uh, communications across a serial connection is a method of data transmission in which the bits are transmitted sequentially over a single channel. With parallel communication, your bits are transmitted simultaneously over multiple wires. So you may have with parallel your 8 bits and your byte travel together. However, in your serial, your 8 bits and your byte travel one at a time. On a WAN link, data is encapsulated by the protocol used by the sending router. Your encapsulated frame is sent on a physical medium to the WAN. And then the receiving router uses the same communication protocol to de-encapsulate the frame when it arrives. The three serial communication standards for LAN to WAN connections are your RS-232, your V.35, and your HSSI. The RS-232 is your most serial ports on personal computers. It conforms to the RS-232C or the newer RS-422 and RS-423 standards. Both our 9-pin and 25-pin connectors are used. And then the serial port is a general purpose interface that can be used for almost any type of device, including your modems, your mice, printers. So this is the serial port, the RS-232. You also have the V.35. It's typically used for the uh, modem to multiplexer communication. Um, this ITU standard is for high-speed synchronous data exchange. And then you have your HSSI, your high-speed serial interface, and it supports transmissions rates up to 52 megabits a second. Our point-to-point -point communication links, we do have links and they can connect two geographically distant sites. Uh, the carrier dedicates specific resources for a line that's leased by the customer. Uh, again, this is where we get our leased lines. And point-to-point -point links are usually more expensive than shared services because you're having to pay for the whole thing. Even if you have leased a line and you're paying for that 
certain service or that dedicated bandwidth, your carrier is still using multiplexing technology within its network. And multiplexing just refers to the scheme that allows multiple logical signals to share a single physical channel. And two of the common types of multiplexing are time division multiplexing or TDM and statistical time division multiplexing. Um, with TDM, it shares available transmission time on a medium by assigning time slot to users. Uh, the multiplexing accepts input from attached devices to alternating sequence. It's kind of a round robin type thing and transmits the data in a recurrent pattern. You have the T1 or E1 and ISDN telephone lines are common examples of the synchronous time division multiplexing. Your statistical time division multiplexing uses a variable time slot length, allowing channels to compete for any free slot space. And your statistical time division multiplexing does not waste high speed line time with inactive channels using the scheme. Uh, so if things aren't being used by the um, one that's using it at that moment, then it's freed up for others to use it as well. The industry uses the synchronous optical networking or SONET, we've talked about that before, or synchronous digital hierarchy standards for optical transport of TDM data. Traffic arriving, arriving at the SONET multiplexer from four places at 2.5 gigabits per second goes out as a single stream at four times 2.5 gigabits or 10 gigs per second. Um, so that's how that works. Prior to the deregulation in North America and other countries, telephone companies owned the local loop, including the wiring, the equipment on the premises um, of the customers. And some of us remember that. Some of us are too young to remember that. Uh, the local loop refers to the line from the premises of the telephone subscriber to the telephone company's central office. Uh, deregulation forced telephone companies to unbundle this to allow other surprises suppliers to um, get in on the action. To, so we now have something that is called the demarcation point and this marks the point where your network interfaces uh, with the network is owned by another organization. Uh, the telephone terminology uh, this is the interface between customer premises equipment or CPE and the network service provider equipment and your demarcation point is the point in the network where the responsibility of the service provider ends. So wherever they're coming in at that demarcation that's where their responsibility stops not yours. Uh, basically that's where yours begins. From the point of view of connecting to a WAN, your serial connection has your DTE devices at one end and your DCE device at the other end. Remember our DCE end is the end that we always clock. So our DTN or our data terminal equipment, that's the end of the user devices on a WAN link. And your DCE equipment is the end of the WAN's provider side of the communication facility. And it's responsible for providing your clocking signal. So DTE is commonly the CPE and it's generally router. It could also be a terminal, a computer, a printer, a fax machine if they cannot directly, if they connect directly to the service provider's network. That's, they're connected to the service provider's network. The DCE is commonly a modem or a CSU DSU. Uh, it's a device used to convert the user data from the DTE into a form acceptable to the WAN service provider transmission link and the signals received at the remote DCE which decodes the, sing the signal back into a sequence of bits and the remote DCE then signals the sequence to the remote DTE.
we have our different types of cabling. We have our different types of modem. Uh, the DTE and DCE interface for a particular standard defines the following specifications. The mechanical and physical, that's the number of pins and connector type. We have electrical, that defines voltage levels um, as either 0 or 1. We have the functional that specifies the functions that are performed by assigning meaning to each of the signaling lines in the interface. We have procedural that specifies the sequence of events for transmitting data. Uh, with the original RS-232 standard, it only defined connections of DTEs with DCEs, which were modems. However, to connect two DTEs, such as two computers or two routers in a lab, a special cable would typically need to be used. However, in our class, we use the cables that were designed uh, to where we don't have to use that special connection in order to connect them correctly. Here is a chart showing the carrier transmission rates. Our bandwidth refers to the rate at which data is transferred over the communication links. The underlying, underlying carrier technology depends on the bandwidth available. And there is a difference in bandwidth points between North America, those are the T carriers uh, specifications, and the European carriers or the E carriers. That's why we refer to them as T1 or E1. The T1s are the American, the E1s are the European.